And so come. Come, mighty. We want to see Jesus. We want to sit at Jesus' feet. We want to listen to him. We want to obey him. Because we know he's right. And we know he's good. And he's for us. So help me. Help me to speak what you want me to speak. Lord, help my heart. Help their heart. And I pray for a couple of things before we get into this text. I pray that you would increase our faith, belief, and help us to heed this warning of unbelief. Number two, that we would love you and love each other more by being in each other's lives. Help me, help us to love each other to the finish line. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus told a parable, Matthew 13, illustrated spirit to truth. It goes like this. It says, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. The birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. When the sun rose, they were scorched. Since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil, produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Don't forget that phrase. Let him hear. I want to hone in on the one explanation that he gives to his disciples about that parable is this one. When he says later, for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecu persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. I was on my way home in the airplane from the conference on Wednesday night two, three hour trip, I don't know what it was, struck up a conversation with my neighbor. Lasted for about that time. Come to find out that he went to the same conference that I went to, so we talked about a lot of stuff. Talked about the conference, we talked about the pastoral life, we talked about kids, and then he started to tell me about his one daughter who was recently killed in a car crash seven or eight kids, some biological, some adopted. And he said, this was my, this was my darling daughter. He's very close to him, and he got that dreaded phone call when he was at another conference. She was on life support, brain dead, 20 years old. So I asked him, I said, how do you, how'd you deal with that? How do you deal with God? And you know what he said to me? Jason, did it hurt? Of course it hurt. Was it agonizing? Of course it was agonizing. Was it painful? It was the worst thing I've ever gone through in my life, but not once. Did I question God's love for us or for her or his sovereign plan for our lives? That he had a purpose. Not even, he just started preaching to me. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from his will, Jason. He numbered every one of her days. He is good. That's what he kept saying. He's good. He's so good to me. He works all things out according to the counsel of His will. Works all things for good, Jason. He's good. He's good. I believe all of His promises. And you know what I said to myself? This man knows Jesus. This man knows God's ways. This man still holds fast even after that. He didn't harden his heart because of trials. 
specifically that trial that I thought about. He'd throw in the towel. He proved that he was a child of God. That's what we're dealing with this morning in verses 7 through 14. And you know this. I've said this before. The author knows. Some of them are, thr- are they're tempted to throw in the towel. Their Christian faith. They're, they're tempted to go back to the Pharisaical temple, Judaism, Moses, because they're being persecuted by the Jews who don't believe in Jesus Christ. Probably telling them, get out of the temple. Telling the neighborhood people, do not support them. Shun them. Don't shop at their businesses. It's okay to spit on them, throw rocks at them, even kill them. So they're tempted, gang. They're tempted to go back to the easy life without pain, trial, tribulation. Forget about Christ. Which some of them probably did, I suspect. And then the question is, I thought they were believers, right? I thought they were believers. So what happened to them? Did they lose their salvation? Or were they the ones Jesus described as rocky ground? Fell away. But how could they fall away (laughs) if they're genuine Christians? That might be your question. And I want to answer. I want to answer that question today. That's why we read verse 6. And we're going to look at verse 14. I think this whole book of Hebrews is about God's people persevering, enduring all the way to the end. This author is so concerned about his brothers and sisters who are saved to persevere in their confidence, in their hope, in their belief in Christ and His great salvation all the way to the end. He wants to get them there. And you know what I took away from that conference? The burning desire of my conference was, I want to get all of you there. I want to love you that much. I want you to get to the finish line, each and every single one of you. Not fall away. Like the unbelieving Israelites. That's what we're going to see today. I think we, we ought to listen to this and learn some lessons from them. Some of you in this room, I don't know all of you in this room, I know a good many of you, and you are believers, but I can't assume that for everybody. Some of you might not be true believers. You're just testing the water. So you just come to Jesus to see what you can get out of Jesus this life. And when trouble hits, you're going you're gonna to leave. I don't want that. It's the difference between a true believer and one who looks like it for a little bit. Look at verse 6. I don't, want to, I don't want this to confuse you believers thinking that a true believer can lose your salvation. Notice very carefully what it says. Very carefully. And we are His house. Did you hear that? We are His house. Present tense. Not will be. Not will be. Future His house. If, that's a big word, (laughs) if we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope, meaning, If we are holding fast our confidence in Christ and we are boasting in the hope that we have because of Christ, then we prove, we prove now that we're His house. Have been His house. That's past tense. By our holding it fast. Do you get it? That's how we prove this. Still holding it. Still hoping. To this day, like my friend Fred was. Even after the trial he went through, he still held fast. This is what we see in verse 14. These are like bookends to me, I think, in this section. With a warning in between. That's what I see. (laughs) That I believe God is using. He uses warnings to keep believers. Separate sheep from goats too, but I think He uses warnings as His love and grace to keep believers. He loves us. He knows that's what spurs us on, right? We can go off track. I thought to myself, He loves me to give me warnings. What father would not warn his son as he's about to go into traffic? You you wouldn't just stay back and let him go. You say, son, stop! Stop! You're going to get killed! What father wouldn't do that? If he loves his son, only a father that hates his son would say nothing. 
So this is God's mercy, gang, to us. This is God's love to us to keep us on the straight and narrow. That's what this writer is concerned about. The perseverance of his saints, of his brothers and sisters. Which again, verse 14, I think teaches. For we've come to share in Christ. Did you hear that? We have come to share. That's past tense. If, there it is again, that big word. <laughs> if, indeed, we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Again, proving that we've come to share in Christ, past tense, back then, at our conversion. Meaning, how do we know that we were really saved then? How do we know? By raising our hand at Awana? We're going to church for 20 years. And I haven't gone to church for 20 years. Attending a Billy Graham crusade, walking down the aisle. That's not how you know you were saved, gang. Too many people are deceived thinking that they're saved by that criteria. When they might not be. The only way we can know that we've come to share in Christ back then is if we still hold to it today our original confidence that we had back then about the gospel of Jesus Christ saving us and we still hold to it firmly and I'm not talking about ups and downs we're still here many of you are still here you're proving that you belong to Christ and I believe a true believer will make it praise God praise God he's the rock Jesus said he will not lose one boy do I love that verse I love that promise. John 8, 39. Philippians 1, 6. He who began a work will what? Complete it. Praise Him. Philippians 1, 6. I thought this little phrase would help me. God keeps you. God has saved you. Keeps you. Evidence of that is you're keeping Him. You're keeping Him. Now, this section should scare you if you're thinking about leaving the faith. Like some of them were. Going back, going back. Judaism, Moses, the old covenant, going back. Going back. So then I'll be accepted by the community. I'd live an easier and comfortable life. So he's going to warn them. He's going to warn them. I'm going to quote their book, the Old Testament. Familiar story they know. They're Jews people, okay? They're Jews. You know that. They know their Old Testament. So he says, Therefore, Therefore, therefore what? Therefore what I just told you about Jesus. I've been telling you about Jesus. I can see this author just saying, Jesus, yeah, Jesus, the one I've been telling you about. Being God, chapter 1, greater than the angels, because he made them. Came a man, died for your sins, take away the wrath of God forever as your high priest, the sent one, last week. He's the son over God's house, which makes him infinitely greater than your greatest hero, Moses. Moses was just a servant. I'm telling you that you're his house only if you hold fast to this confession and keep believing it. Therefore, verse 7, warning, warning. This whole section is a warning against unbelief. Therefore, therefore, he says, as the Holy Spirit says, I love that. I love that. I'm going to tell you why I love that. Because that confirms what I believe about this book. It was written by the Holy Spirit. Through the pens of men. Because what the Holy Spirit is about to say is part of Psalm 95. That's where this comes from. That psalm was written by David. But David was inspired to write that by the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe about this book. God wrote this book. So Second Peter teaches, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke, wrote from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that says to me, man, listen up, listen up. The Holy Spirit is talking. He's talking. Whenever, this past week, I'm sitting under preaching. Listen, Jason. The Holy Spirit is speaking. Do you notice that this is present tense? The Holy Spirit says, says, 
in Moses' day, the quote happened in Moses' day, in David's day, because he applied this to the people of his day in Psalm 95, and now the Hebrews, they're reading this. The Holy Spirit is talking and taking this and applying it to their lives. And now we're reading this. So the Holy Spirit's saying this to us. He's saying this to us right now. What he's about to warn them about, Israel's past unbelief. Which is why Paul wrote this in Second or 1 Corinthians 10, 11. These things were written for our instruction. So let's take heed what happened to them. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, quote, today. I just I can't get past these words. I'm like ready to jump in here just to explain everything. I'm like, today, duh, today, today, not tomorrow, today, right now, <laughs> sitting here in these chairs. Today, listen, not tomorrow, not later, like some people say, I just wait, you know, down the road. I'll think about God down the road. I get older, closer to my deathbed. Can I say this? If you don't listen to him today, you will only get harder tomorrow. And harder the day after. So I would not bank on that think, that thinking. So listen. Listen carefully to these words today, this sermon today. Today, he says, if you hear his voice, if you hear his voice, which you are hearing his voice through the proclamation of the word, question is, are you listening? Are you really listening? That's the question. And what are you going to do about it? Hopefully not verse 8. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now when I read that, my questions come. Because I don't want to do that. Do you want to do that? I don't want to do this. So what's the rebellion? Who's rebelling? And how did they rebel? That's what I'm asking. I'm asking questions of the text. We're told in the next three lines, in 8 and 9, that they hardened their hearts on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Now we know. Now we know who, who we're talking about here. These are the Israelites. The Israelites in the desert after Moses delivers them out of Egypt. And it says they harden their hearts on the day of testing. Day of testing I found a couple of them in Exodus chapters 15 through 17, where we are told after three days, three days in the wilderness, this is after the Red Sea, says they didn't find any water. Now, how do you think they responded to that? Let me ask you that. You think they said, no big deal. I mean, he just sent plagues, split the Red Sea. He delivered us from slavery. Surely He could give us. We trust Him. He could give us water. It's no problem for Him. Do you think that's what they said? No. It says they grumbled against Moses. What shall we drink? Moses cried out to the Lord. The Lord showed him a log. You remember the story. He threw it in the water and the water became sweet. I thought to myself, God's been merciful there. I would have struck him down that time. It says this in the next verse. God tested them, saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, do that which is right in His eyes, give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Your healer. I thought to myself, he, He's testing them. He's testing them. And then I read in the next verse, they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water. Think about that, gang. Would, ha would they have grumbled if they knew that was just right around the corner? Trust in God? Next chapter is about the man and the meat. After they grumble about food. Moses and Aaron, they say this, that we had died by the hand of the Lord. Think about that. In Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots, ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. In other words, why did you bring us out here? 
God. This isn't really against Moses and Aaron. This is against God. Why did you save us? And bring us out here. This isn't the promised land that you promised to us. You see, they wanted it now. They wanted it now. They wanted this promised land now. More than they wanted God, which is why I think he's testing them. So take us back to Egypt. We'd rather be in slavery, eating meat and bread. Because we really don't believe that you're going to take care of us, lead us into the promised land. Yet God still, he still had mercy. He gave a man in the morning, quail at night. Still had mercy on them. And they grumble again about water. Chapter 17. They quarreled with Moses, it says, and Aaron, and said, give us water to drink. Moses said, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you quarrel with me and test the Lord? So Moses intercedes again on their behalf. And the Lord had mercy on them and gave them water from the rock. You know the story. But it does say at the end of that that Moses called to place Massa and Meribah. You know what that means? Test and quarrel. Test and quarrel. So again, this whole time, God is testing them, which is what it says right here in Hebrews 3.8. On the day of testing in the wilderness. I think this also probably included the 12 spies. Do you remember this story? They sent out, spy out the promised land, and they came back, and they said this, except for Joshua and Caleb. You know the story. We came to the land to which you sent us, It flows with milk and honey. But the people who dwell there are strong. Cities are fortified and very large. We're not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we are. And here's Joshua and Caleb. Here's what they say. Don't rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land. The Lord is with us. Don't fear them. But they do. And they turn against the Lord, and they also turn against Joshua and Caleb. And I don't know if you remember reading this, but they try to stone them, kill them. I thought to myself, what's happening here? What is going on here? My only conclusion is their hearts are hard, their eyes are blind, they are full of unbelief. Even after God delivered them from Egypt, provided food and water, promised them this very land. They're going to stone Joshua and Caleb and essentially say to God, you don't want to give us this land of Canaan. You want to kill us. You saved us to kill us. Does that sound reasonable? No wonder it says in verse 9 that your fathers put me to the test. Probably meaning testing my patience with your wicked beliefs about me. Grumbling. You love your belly more than you love me. Right after the incident with the water, the naming of the place, test, quarrel, it says, the quarreling of the people of Israel tested the Lord by saying this. Is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? Because really, they don't believe He is. And that's saying a whole bunch of things, I think. He doesn't love us. He doesn't care for us. He's not providing for us. Even though he saved us from slavery, he split the Red Sea, (laughs) covers it with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, and gave us manna and water and meat. But I don't really think God's with us. I don't really think he loves me or cares for me. He wants to kill me. Brothers and sisters, that puts him to the test. When you say wrong things about the Lord. And believe wrong things about the Lord. It puts him to the test. Even though he goes on to say, God says, quoted here in verse 9, they saw my works for 40 years. 40 years. They still put me to the test. And rebelled against me. Hardened their heart against me. After 40 years of seeing, did you notice that? Saw. They saw my works For 40 years with their own two eyes. Plagues splitting the Red Sea. Pillar of fire. Cloud feeding them manna from heaven. Giving them water from a rock. Giving them the Ten Commandments. Giving them good laws. Warning them about sin. Driving out their enemies. Giving them a place to worship. Being in my presence. Giving them a way to be forgiven through sacrifice. They saw His works for 40 years. 
and he still rebelled against me. One of the most heartbreaking statements I think that God ever said in reference to this is in Numbers 14.11. This is what he said to Moses. How long will this people despise me? How heartbreaking is that? Our God. How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I've done among them. Therefore, he says in verse 10, I was provoked with that generation. That doesn't mean he's a little bit annoyed, gang. That word means he's angry. He's angry. Because, he says, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. Gang, that's the reason they are rebelling. It's because their hearts are always going astray. Believing and saying, he's not here He's not among us. Even though He saved us, protected us, gave us manna, water, good laws, He's really not for us. He wants to kill us. He didn't really save us. Gang, that's an unbelieving heart. Jesus didn't take long, did it? Let's create our own gods. We don't got to fear. Let us do whatever we want to do. We saw this in Hosea. It's an unbelieving heart. Heart. He's emphasizing the heart. There's a reason he's emphasizing the heart because everything comes from the heart. If you're sitting in Dan's class, you're going to hear this. The biblical word for heart is everything. It's will, it's emotions, it's beliefs, it's everything. It's wrapped up in the biblical word for heart. It controls everything we think, say, do, crave. And they don't believe the truth about God at all. And here's what's interesting to me. What he says next, they have not known my ways. They have not known my ways, which I think from this text was the right thinking and believing according to the word of God in the midst of wilderness testing. That believes God has set. See, here's what they should be believing. God set his love on us. That's what he said in Deuteronomy 7. I want you as my special possession. He promised this. Even way back to Abraham. But to choose a nation. Plays out in the Exodus. Saves them from slavery. Protects them from their enemies. Covers up the Egyptians in the Red Sea. Provides for them food and water, fire and cloud. Driving out their enemies so that they can get into the promised land. But as soon as a little bit of hunger, a little bit of thirst, a little bit of discomfort, bigger and larger people in the land, they come at them. It's testing. It's testing. That's His way. That's God's way. To test them. Are they going to trust Me? Are they going to trust Me? After seeing everything I've done for them, are they going to trust Me? Are they going to follow Me? Are they going to obey Me? Are they going to worship Me? Believe that I love them. I saved them. I'm protecting them. And I promise to them. And want them for My own. But here's the question. Do they want Me for their own? More than the comforts of this world and the sin of this world. Gang, that's the reason for the testing. Those are His ways. Those are His ways. And I thought to myself, do I realize His ways? We can apply this. Here's the application. Do we know His ways in our wilderness wanderings when trials come to us in this life and they will we live in a fallen world you know this jesus said you will have many trials and tribulations and so the question is how am i going to respond what am i going to believe about these trials what am i going to believe about god that'll make the difference between knowing His ways and not knowing His ways. A hard heart or a soft heart towards God. That God is out either to get me or kill me or test me. To grow my faith. Wean me off the world. Depend on Him more and more. Love Him more than this life. Those are all His ways given in the Scripture. And the question for me was, does my heart believe it? Does my heart believe it? 
Count it all joy like James 1 says. Because He does love me. He's for me. He's working all things for my good, including my sufferings. That produces perseverance, greater faith, greater holiness, greater love for the next world, and especially to be with Jesus instead of this place. Do I believe this? Or do I believe He's out to get me? Just make my life miserable. The Bible says here, It's interesting to me. It's a connection. That the heart that believes that God's out to get me is a hard and rebellious heart. Doesn't know His ways. Now that was application for believers. This is primarily for unbelievers. Totally hard. I'm trying to apply this to myself as a believer. Because I don't know about you, but I I can grumble and complain. Anybody else with me? I can grumble and complain. And the Bible tells me not to grumble and complain. You know that. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. It's Philippians 2. We studied that. So the the bottom line is here. My grumbling and my complaining, I think, comes from a heart of unbelief. Now that doesn't discount. I hope you know me well enough. That does not discount suffering, crying out to God, having godly sorrow over a lost loved one. It's not what we're talking about here. The Bible gives plenty of passages to do that. even encourages us to do that. Run to Jesus for help. He did that too. But think about Israel compared to Jesus. Jesus not once grumbled or complained and said, God's out to get me. God doesn't love me. He doesn't care for me. Gave me empty promises. Because I'm not getting them right now, but a trial in the desert, a <laughs> bunch of disciples who don't even believe in me, a bunch of people who follow me because they want free bread, hassled by religious leaders who are trying to trap me and call me the devil, betrayed by one of my own, ridiculed, called a phony, mocked, beaten to a pulp, hung up on a cross, naked, brothers and sisters, he was tested more than any of us. And he never once grumbled or complained. That's why we need them. That's why we desperately need them. That's coming in chapter 4. This is huge. This is huge. I asked myself, how did my friend keep believing and holding fast to his confidence after losing his daughter? Or like so many of you that are going through trials, it's because you know God and you know His ways. That's for believers. What happens to unbelievers who just keep going astray, harden their heart. They don't enter the promised land. That's, that's what he's saying here for them. They don't find rest in the presence of God. You see that in verse 11? As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Gang, the only place to find rest is in God. The only place. That means believing in Him, trusting Him, following Him, which they did not do. And they were not allowed in the promised land. Except for Joshua and Caleb who did believe Him. And you could probably apply it this way too. To them and to us. This rest right now. This rest right now. God's rest in your soul. If you believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins because of what He's done for you, you can have peace with God. Because God's not mad at you anymore for your sins. We've been studying this, seeing this in the book of Hebrews where He became our high priest to take away our sin, make purification, and absorb all the wrath and anger that was on us, on me, for everything that I've ever done. We'll do every sin, every single one. Jesus took, paid the penalty, absorbed the wrath of God that I deserve for that in hell, and He drank it completely and took it away. That's rest. That's rest. Where God is for you now, loves you, favors you as your Father, and is not ashamed of you and your brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, that's rest. That's rest. We're going to get to this again in chapter 4. No wonder Jesus said, 
Come to me. Come to me. All you who are heavy and weary, lady, come to me and I will give you rest. Rest. This is what he wants for them. He wants to exhort them now. Don't go in the way that they did. Don't go in the way that they did with an unbelieving heart. Remember, they're tempted to throw it all away. Go back to the old covenant. Being persecuted by unbelieving Jews. So he warns them in verse 12 about unbelief. And then I think he gives them the remedy for unbelief in verse 13. And it might surprise you. But here, let's look at the warning first. Look at verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Now, What is the first thing that you notice right here in the text? What's the first thing he says? It's an admonition to take care. Take care or pay attention. If you've been here for Hebrews, pay attention. Consider, take heed. Don't blow this off. Don't be careless about this. That's what he's saying. Don't say to yourself, it's not a big deal. Which is why I think there's a call in the Scriptures from the Apostle Paul. Take care. Test yourself. Make sure you're in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Watch your heart, for from it flows the springs of life. Proverbs 4.23 Gang, you, you cannot be lackadaisical about the Christian life. You cannot be nonchalant. You can't coast. You can't be lukewarm. Not care. Whatever you want to call this. Brothers and sisters, there's too many people, I believe, in our churches that take care of so many other things. Pay attention to other things in this world. And we got to, to a certain extent, like work, bands, sports, jobs, boyfriends. But this is the most important thing. This, that we got to be taking care of. Instead of just sitting back and being passive in the Christian life, he's calling us to be diligent. Diligent. Be diligent to confirm your election and calling. That's what Peter said. Be diligent. Pay attention. Take care. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, me included, leading you to fall away from the living God. Because you will. You will. If you throw Christ away, go back to Judaism. You will fall away from the living God. If you don't believe Jesus is God, greater than the angels, greater than Moses. Came a man and died for your sins, make you a child of God, you will fall away. And gang for them, I'm feeling like the pressure's on for them. The pressure's on. Religious leaders are telling them Jesus was a phony. Did those miracles by the power of the devil. He didn't come from Bethlehem. So I supposed to come from Bethlehem. He was the man. We know his mother and his father. They're hearing all this. He's still dead. Yeah, 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 yeah. They say he's alive. That's what they say. But we're the ones, we're the ones who study this book. We know this book. We know where the true Messiah comes from, what he looks like. You willing to lose everything? Your house, your home, synagogue, business? We don't support false messiahs. Pressure's on. So what are they going to do? They're going to keep believing, they're going to fall away with an unbelieving heart, which is evil. The author says is evil. And I want to warn you. I want to warn you about the heart. Even as, an, as a believer, I need to warn you about your heart. That your heart can be susceptible to unbelieving. Now, you've got a new one. You've got a new one. Praise God. We've got a new heart. Ripped out the heart of stone, give us a heart of flesh. But you still have sin in you. You still have it in you. Which is evil. And when your heart is not under the influence of the Spirit of God and the Word of God, your heart is going to be evil. It's not going to believe the truth. You still got that in you, even after you believe. There's just so much language in the Bible that terrifies me about my own heart. Why don't I do what I want to do? That's the Apostle Paul for Pete's sake. So if he struggled, I'm going to struggle. My heart is wicked and deceitful above all else. Where do we read that, Jeremiah? 
Please don't listen to Disney. Think about them right now. God doesn't love me. Is He really here? Does He care about me? He's not really for me. He's giving me trials and tribulations. If He really loved me, He wouldn't give me any. He's out to get me. Not give me greater faith or conform me into the image of His Son. Which means He's got to refine this sin in me. That thinking and that believing is not going to come. It's not going to come from your evil, unbelieving flesh. You've got to be able to recognize that. And the only way you can recognize that is to know your Bible and discern what the truth is and know His ways. Not give in to your evil, unbelieving heart that will lead you to fall away from the living God. Which happened? Which happened? To some. Totally, decisively, finally, you know this. Total apostasy. It's what the word means. Probably it happened to a lot of these Israelites. Think of Judas. Judas Iscariot. Or Demas, who worked with Paul in the ministry at first, then left because he loved the world, says Second Timothy. Proved that he never truly belonged to Jesus. I also think this can be a warning for those who are in the house, partakers of Christ. And you might say, well, why do I have to pay attention to my heart so much, Pastor? Take, take care. If I'm already saved, have the, have the Spirit and a new heart. Now, never lose my salvation. I love pastors when they say this. Don't go down that road. The Bible never teaches that His truly saved ones are going to have it peachy keen in this life without any hardship or pain or trial or sin causing you to stumble or causing you to unbelief. Or the devil coming after you to tempt you to not believe God. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about being diligent over your own heart. Never says this in the Bible. I love these texts. Some people point it out. Jesus said, strive to enter by the narrow door. Strive. That implies diligence. Taking care. Watching out. Same thing Peter writes when he says, be sober. Watchful. The devil's prowling around. Seeking to devour. I already said this. Paul said, there's nothing good in my flesh. Nothing good in my flesh. Man, you've got to always be diligent in the power of God. He'll give you this power. If you ask him, you've got to be diligent, gang. Nothing good in my flesh. That's why Paul's on his knees all the time. So I've got to take every thought captive that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And make it obedient to Jesus Christ. That's diligence. That's taking care. That's fighting the good fight. Gang, the Christian life's war. It's war. It's not sitting on our, I had this mental image this morning. <laughs> it's not sitting on the raft in the swimming pool your entire life. Just floating. And let life take me wherever it takes me. I don't care. Now there is rest in the Christian life, but there's war. You gotta jump in the pool and swim. You want to get stronger? Some of you go to the pool to get ex to exercise and get stronger. You gotta jump in and swim. That's how you get stronger in the Christian life. Not by being passive. Not by being passive. This is how you know you belong to God, I think. That you're keeping. You're believing. You keep fighting a good fight. That's how you know you belong. If you're not doing that, gang, I fear for you. I fear for you. Most of you I know, you are doing this. But for some of you who are not, I'm going to call you out today and ask you to examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith. Especially if you're being passive. You've always been passive. Don't care. You don't care to be sober, diligent about my faith. Listen, if you're counting on your past decision, if you're counting on church attendance, if you're counting on taking communion, if you're counting on getting baptized, all these outward religious things and you're not taking care, you haven't taken care, you haven't been diligent, you're not fighting the good faith, I'm going to say to you, as lovingly as I can, you're not born again. The born again person will do this because the Spirit of God is in him or her producing this. Now again, this isn't ups and downs. I'm talking about the person 
who just goes to church, does religious things, and never thinks about God ever again in between those times. Doesn't read his Bible, doesn't pray, doesn't care to fight a good fight, holiness, any of those things. And they're counting on, I grew up in a church. I go to church. I'm telling you this because I want to get you there. I want to get you there. And you all, I want you to look around to each other because here's what I've been praying. Lord, help us, help me to love one another enough to get you to heaven. That I care about you and you and you. I want to get you to heaven. We need to care about each other that much to get each other to heaven. And that means we're going to be in each other's lives. That's what verse 13 is all about. This is the remedy, gang, against unbelief. Look at a verse. Exhort one another every day. Every day, as long it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I said that this might surprise you earlier. I said that because what the author is saying here is that we need the church. We need the church to keep believing. Do not fall into unbelief and sin and evil. How? He says to exhort one another every day. Every day. The word exhort means to come alongside of each other and call out. Call out. Come on. Come on. Keep believing. Keep confidence. Trust Christ. Let me tell you who He is. It's what I do every Sunday. I'm exhorting you. That's what preaching is. Come on. This is Christ. This is what He's done for you. Come on, keep believing. Let's go. You need me and I need you, gang. This goes beyond preaching Sundays. Did you notice it says, every day? Every day? Exhort one another every day. Can I? Can I say this? I don't want anybody in here to be an island to themselves. I've seen it far too often when they are an island and then they disappear. There's nobody in their life that is speaking truth, showing them Jesus, encouraging them, pointing out sin, keeping you in the fight. You need people in your life. I need you in my life. Can I encourage you? Find friend, believing spouse, friends, Bible study, small group. I'll make a plug for you, Dan. Shameless plug. Small group's a great way to do this. Be in somebody's life, other people's life. And they need to be in your life, gang. You need each other to keep believing. This is God's means. This is one of His means of grace for to get us to the finish line, to persevere, to endure. I need you. You need me. And let me tell you something. I'll tell you what sin does. What did Paul Tripp used to say? Sin always deceives. And the first one that always deceives is me. You might be sitting there saying to yourself, I don't need this. I'm okay by myself. I don't need someone else in my my life. Me and God, man. Me and God. That's deception. That's sin in you deceiving you. And I get it. Some of you are wired to be introverts. I'm an introvert and an extrovert. I'm just a plain old bird, I think. I don't know if I buy any of that, but I know it's harder. It's harder for some of us, but you've got to work at this game. Your perseverance and endurance to the finish line depends on this. It depends on this. So please, search it out. Search somebody out. Get yourself into a group. So that we make it to the end. Verse 14. We've come to share in Christ. If indeed, we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Anybody want to get to the end? I want to get to the end. I need you to help me get to the end. And I want to help you get to the end. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this warning. Thank you for this remedy. Would you help us? I ask for his two great miracles. Oh God, would you keep us 
from unbelief, would you help us? Grant us power through your spirit, through your word, to believe the right things, your ways. Help us to see you clearly, especially in our trials and our temptations and our sufferings. Help us. Oh, we need it. We so desperately need it. We still have sinned, Lord. We can think wrongly about you. Please help us to know our Bibles, to know your ways, to know that you're our Father, that you love us, that there's a reason and a purpose. Just like my friend said, so many of her friends came to Christ because of her death. You're a good God and it still hurts. The Bible teaches that too, you know that. But you're still good. You're still good. So help us to believe the right things. Secondly, Lord, help us to be in each other's lives. Help us to seek people out, groups, whatever we gotta do, Lord, because our perseverance depends on it. Do that work in us. You've spoken today. Not me. Use my voice, but the Holy Spirit spoke through this text. Help us to listen to you. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand with us.